Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Let me begin by suggesting that whatever information you hear in uh, the delivery here, don't automatically take that and add it to whatever else you may have heard, thinking uh, this is a new fact, I'll put it along with the other things I've heard about Christianity. Uh, that can lead to a lot of confusion, because probably most of what you've heard before isn't true. Uh, to put it very bluntly, there's a great deal of misunderstanding among Muslims concerning Christianity, so be very careful about just what you do hold to be the case. The main thing is to consider the source. That is, if you think you know a thing about Christianity, where did you hear it anyway? Did you hear it from a Christian? Well, then it probably is true. Did you hear it from a Muslim? Well, think again. What was his source? There's really two kinds of Christian source and uh, two kinds of Muslim source. Uh, we'll try to explain the two kinds of Christian sources as we go along, uh, but consider that any question you may ask of a Christian, his answer will depend on which of the two types of Christianity does he belong to. But more about those types later. If you ask a Muslim something about Christianity, you have to ask him what is your authority for what you say. Uh, there are Muslims who are well informed. There are Muslims who have never met Christians but are still well informed because they take the care to double check their sources. Not too long ago, uh, group of people who were active in uh, this outreach to Christians in Pakistan had sent me a copy of some literature that they had written. They simply wanted me to look it over to say, is there something in here that isn't true? Now, I'm not saying every Muslim ought to send something to me so I can look it over first. But the attitude was that they want to ask other people who should know something about this. And that's following in the best tradition of the Quran. That's the advice always given. If you don't know, ask the man who knows. It tells you again and again. Don't just take hearsay or uh, take any information without double-checking it. You're supposed to confirm what you hear. The Quran talks, of course, about people of the book. And usually the Muslim thinks, yes, Jews and Christians. Well, that's possibly too quick of a generalization because the Quran says people of the book, and if you quickly say, oh, those are Jews and Christians, then you tar start to automatically think, well, when the Quran says the book, it must mean the Bible. And that's not true. That's a very basic point that I'd like to stress. When the Quran talks about the book, it's not talking about the Bible. For the simple reason that the Bible doesn't talk about the Bible. That word is a nickname. It's not in the Bible anywhere. It's a nickname in the English language and a few other languages. And the Danish say uh, Bibel and the, and the English say Bible. The Germans say Heilige Schrift, which means the Holy Writings. That's perhaps a more accurate title. Bible is a nickname that just means library. So this collection of writings has come to be called Bible. But the Quran talks about the book. And it's a tactic that's often used by uh, missionaries to Muslims to say, look, your book says my book is correct. Well, your book doesn't talk about uh, their book. It talks about a book. And we'll get into more about that later. As to what exactly the Bible is, uh, physically it's a collection of writings. Uh, different groups recognize different writings as making up the Bible. The uh, Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church at least, uh, recognizes 72 books in the Bible as well as some additions to some books. Uh, most Protestants would recognize 66 books as being the library that makes up the Bible and the Eastern Orthodox churches have some other opinions. But by and large when people say Bible probably most Muslims are in contact with people who are talking about the 66 recognized by the Protestant half of Christianity. So it is a library, a collection of 66 books, which is usually divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament has 39 books, and all of these were written before the time of Jesus. The New Testament is simply a nickname for the 27 books written after the time of Jesus. The names of the books 
uh, we could recite them all, but the names are simply uh, nicknames. They're something like the nicknames of surahs in the Quran, the chapters of the Quran. The names of those surahs are just nicknames the Muslims give for the sake of convenience. And in the same sense, the Bible has nicknames. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and so on. They're nicknames taken out of the book. The books don't give themselves those titles. So that you have, for example, four accounts of the life of Jesus, which usually go by the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those books don't name themselves Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That is, the name Matthew is not in the book called the Gospel of Matthew. Mark's name is not in Mark, and uh, Luke's name is not in Luke, and John's name is not in John. So that those names are assigned by tradition, that traditionally these are the men who wrote those books, but the books don't actually say so. They don't begin by saying, I, Matthew, now write such and such. Some books do begin that way. We have uh, the Bible books of the so-called minor prophets, for example, which usually begin by saying who is writing the book. In any case, these nicknames had been passed along through the centuries, and it was in the early Middle Ages that for the sake of uh, convenience, some scholars divided these books into chapters. This too didn't form part of the original text. And it was some hundreds of years after that that these chapters were then divided into verses. But the book is not written according to chapters and verses. This is a division made by people who possess the books already simply for the sake of reference. So that if someone says in uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 2, it says, we mean the book of Matthew, the 27th chapter and the fourth verse or second verse, this has been uh, more or less universally recognized, this division according to the verses. But it was not part of the original writing. As I say, many writings existed among the Jews and the Christians. Many, many writings. Uh, the Bible itself talks about those writings. In fact, very often you have uh, places where the Bible books cite these other writings, which are not in the Bible, as references. In the books of Joshua and Judges, for example, it will tell a little bit about a historical event and then say, for further information, see the book of... Jasher or the book of Kings and uh, so on. These are books that are not in the Bible but they existed at the time when these Bible writings were uh, first put together and so they were cited as reference. Uh, this continued right down to the time of Jesus and beyond. You have for example in the little Bible book of Jude which was written after the time of Jesus a quotation from the book of Enoch. Now, the book of Enoch isn't in the Bible. It still exists. You still get a hold of a copy of it, but it's not recognized as part of the Holy Scriptures. Although one would have to think that Jude must have thought highly of it if he's quoting it and putting it in his letter. In the book called Second Timothy, as the second of two letters written by Paul to Timothy, apparently, in the third chapter, Paul talks about the high priests who opposed Moses and he names them as Janus and Jambres. Well, nowhere in the Bible will you find those names Janus and Jambres assigned to those people, so wherever he got that information it was from some other book outside of the Bible. The reason I mention that is because it leads to the first main point that I want to make. It is in this same chapter, a chapter 2 Timothy 3.16, that there is a very frequently quoted passage it reads in this place that all scripture is inspired of God. And there is a school of thought in Christianity, among others, but there is one school of thought, which emphasizes very much, in this verse they say the writer is claiming that all of the Bible was given by God. It's a possible meaning, I suppose, but it requires some interpretation because what the man has said is that all scripture is inspired of God and a person has to say well when he said scripture he meant Bible but what he said was scripture and whether or not what he meant is what people now mean when they say scripture is a debatable point as I say Bible is a nickname given sometime later to what we have come to regard as scripture there's also the point that 
the sentence is just as easily translated from the uh, Greek that it was originally written in as to mean that every scripture which is inspired of God is beneficial. That is to say there's a lot of things that are script that people write, but only the ones that God directed are the ones that are worthwhile. That too makes a lot of sense, and it's an alternate view. This verse is often used, as I say, by some to try to say, no, all of the Bible came from God. Well, it won't quite do the job, because if it's put in context, it uh, simply cannot refer to the entire Bible. The verse before it is the one that is really never read. It's not included with it. In the verse before this, as Paul wrote to Timothy, he mentioned what he regarded as Scripture. He told Timothy, he said, the Scripture, which you've been reading since you were a boy, all Scripture is inspired of God, and so on. Well, when Timothy was a boy, the New Testament didn't exist, hadn't been written yet. So whatever Paul's talking about, he's not talking about a great deal of what is now regarded as Scripture. There's another verse that's often used very much out of context in the same regard. The third last verse in the Bible, it's in a book called Revelation or the Apocalypse, says that no one should add to this book or take from this book or he will be cursed. So sometimes people point to this verse and say, you see, in this place God says my book is finished. Says, don't let anyone take anything away, don't let anyone add anything, or he'll be cursed. That's the end of my book. Well, it's interesting that the same people will tell you if you press the point, they may not know, but they can go and look it up, I suppose, uh, that there's no dispute. Nobody will dispute the fact that this book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, was not the last book written. There were three written afterwards, at least. First, second, third John. They were written years later, but they are put in ahead of number 66. You have 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, then a little short book of Jude, then the book of Revelation. So Revelation is last in the Bible just because it's been put in that place, not because it was written last. So this verse which says, don't let anyone add or take from this book, can only be talking about this little book of Revelation, not this whole book of 66 books collected together. That is appreciated by most people, I want to stress. Most Christians know that. Uh, it's just uh, a shame that perhaps those who speak the loudest, uh, those that you're most likely to see if you turn on the television, do not appreciate that point. And so they lay a great deal of stress on this to say, this is God's book. Here's where he finished it. It simply isn't true. The Muslim is rather frustrated in trying to uh, consider the Bible for a number of reasons but the first obvious thing that occurs to him is if someone says to him all of this came from God he wants to know where does it say that does it say that somewhere in there does God make that claim in this book you say he wrote and this is what's missing these are two examples that uh, suggested that people often try to use and it's about the best they can do but there is no claim of total inspiration what you have instead are statements like in one of the Old Testament books, the book of Jonah, this is Eunice of the Koran, this book begins by saying, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, quote, here the man starts by saying, God gave me something to say, and here it is. He claims what you're about to read came from God. If you compare that to the introduction of the Gospel of Luke, which is a story of the life of Jesus, this man begins by saying, many people have already written about Jesus, so I thought it would be a good idea to do so myself. doesn't claim God is guiding my pen, guarding my thoughts, protecting me from error. He says, it seemed like a good idea. It's in the first chapter of the book of Luke. It's variously translated as, it seemed the fitting thing to do, it seemed proper, uh, and so on. But this is not a claim of inspiration. Now, I want to stress that very often Muslims get excited by saying, the Bible has been changed. Be careful when you say that. Because I hope you see the point already that I've been trying to make. Bible is a name which has been given to a collection of books. It's not as though 
long, long ago, there was a book called The Bible. It was the true book. But then the Jews and the Christians, they went through and they scrubbed out some words and they wrote different words in it, and now we have a false Bible. That's not the way it happened. They had books, and over the centuries came to move some up to say, these are worth more than these books. And more time passes to say, these books came from God, these didn't. So, it might more accurately be put as, the Bible has changed. Not that the Bible's been changed, like they had a true one and they made it into a false one. It's a matter of evolution. What has been called the Bible, or what has been regarded as Scripture, has changed in people's opinions over the years. So my first point again is that those things which are regarded as Scripture have been a matter of debate over the centuries. As a matter of fact, it isn't widely known, but it's a simple matter to check out. The man who is usually regarded as the father of the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, had some unusual opinions about Scripture by the standards of most Protestants today, I suppose. Up to the time of Martin Luther, in the, uh, about the uh, 16th century, as it would be, uh, four to five hundred years ago, the church was, for the most part, dominated by the Roman Catholic version of Christianity in Europe. Martin Luther protested and Christianity split in Europe into the Catholic and Protestant uh, halves. Luther had an opinion that not all of the four Gospels were worth the same amount. He decided that the book of Revelation didn't reveal anything. He took three of the books of the Bible, James, Hebrews, and Revelation, and in his edition of the Bible, moved them to an appendix, took them out of the text of the Bible, and said they go in the back, they're reference, but they don't belong up here with the inspired scripture. Now, Lutherans, the denomination that take their name from this man, have since moved them back. It uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> the point is it was being debated. It was in doubt, even as recently as just a few hundred years ago. Uh, people tend to solve that problem, if you point it out to them. They supposedly solve it by saying, well, Luther was wrong. That doesn't really solve the problem. Because the issue is not whether Luther was right or wrong. The point the Muslim is trying to make here is that those things which are scripture have been in debate. That's all you mean to prove. Within Christianity. It hasn't necessarily been people who hate Christianity that have been always trying to challenge the Christian. It's been sincere people within the Christian church who have said, we should be more careful. Maybe this and maybe that. Our point here is, again, that if a book does not claim authenticity, doesn't claim, that is, to be inspired by God but we believe it is then we are trusting the opinion of somebody or to put it this way the Muslim might say does the Bible claim to be God's word and if you've had a good discussion on this matter the Christian may say well no it doesn't precisely claim to be God's word in total but Christians have always regarded it as such well that isn't true because they've been debating it. To which they would say, yes, but true Christians have always regarded this as Scripture. And what he really means is, Christians who think like me have always regarded this as Scripture. True is a label he gives to people who agree with him. The point is, it has been in debate. And as a matter of fact, what has been the attitude of previous peoples to Scripture? How much is it worth? And here again is where a Muslim can fall into some difficulty if he's unaware of some key terminology. The Quran, when it talks about previous revelations to people, mentions by name the Torah, Zabur, and Injil. And too often, carelessly enough, the Muslim hears a little bit about what the Bible is, and he thinks, oh, Torah, that's the Old Testament. Uh, Zabur, that's the Psalms. And Injil, uh, that's the New Testament not even close on that. It's drastically different than that. The Torah was the law given to the Jews. The precise words given to Moses, Musa, to deliver to the Jews, or children of Israel as they were uh, known at that time. 
the Torah does not make up the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, in the book of Jeremiah, an Old Testament book, and this is regarded by some Jewish scholars as the only authentic book left in the Bible. That's an extreme position, but it just shows that this is how confident the Jewish scholars are of the authenticity of the book of Jeremiah. We find an interesting thing in the 8th chapter. In the time of Jeremiah, which is hundreds of years after the time of the revelation of the Torah, the Jews were saying, we have the Torah. And in verse 8, what is the reply to that? God speaking through Jeremiah says, Do they say they have the Torah? What they have is what the scribes write with their lying pens. So here, a few hundred years after the time of the giving of the Torah, the Jews who say, this, this is the Torah, were told, no, no, what you have left there is something that scribes, people who write script, scripture writers, have written with their lying pens. That's within the Bible. As to Zabur, which uh, I'm afraid some Muslim commentators often say these are the Psalms, it should be careful. Uh, the only word that even looks like Zabur anywhere in the Bible is in another place. And it's talking about the song of Deborah, which is a composition, which is what Zabur is often thought to be, a composition in the form of uh, poetry or song. And as to Injil, again keep in mind that the Injil is said to be a precise message given to Jesus to give to people. There's nothing like that in the Bible. The words of Jesus are reported in four stories of his life, not in a book he wrote. There's nothing in the Bible written by Jesus. What you have are four different people who said, this is the story of Jesus. One day this, and the next day that, and so on. You don't have in there his message, except for some quotations of a few things he said. So, some of those things may be accurate, and they may reflect what the Injil said, but it's not the Injil. It'd be similar to the situation to where Muslims would have found themselves if all they had was hadith. They said, the message delivered by our prophet is in these stories about his life. But that's not the way we do it. We have some historical reports of his life, but his message is in this book, the Quran. The Injil is supposed to be something like the Quran. A message as such, not a history of somebody's life, and incidentally some of the things he used to say. The word in Jeel occurs only once in the Bible. It's in the Gospel account according to Mark, which, ironically enough, begins by saying uh, uh, that this is the beginning of the Evangel, or in Jeel, of Jesus. The beginning. Why that uh, is ironical is that um, the ending of the book of Mark is missing. That is, just at a very important part in the story, it stops at the 8th verse of chapter 16. There are about 70 stories of the life of Jesus known or known about. 70, 70, 70 different Gospels. Four are in the Bible. The rest you can look up in the library. You have the Gospel of the Hebrews and the Gospel according to Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of the Nativity and various other things, which are usually called the Apocrypha, that is, the Christian community says these are false gospels. And they may have some truth in them, but they're not God's word. It's interesting, and we'll try to see how it was he decided which ones were the legitimate four and which ones weren't. But here is our second main point. What does the Quran say about those scriptures that the Jews and the Christians have? Well, it does not specifically say they have changed them. I want to stress that again. It says basically three things. It says they have changed the words from their proper places and goes on to illustrate how this actually happened. It didn't mean that here was a true Bible and somebody wiped out a word and he wrote a false one in. It meant he may have had the truth in front of him, but he didn't tell somebody else what it said. And that goes on even till now. To give an example, the Bible is written in three languages which nobody speaks today. That is, aside from a handful of people who have studied these ancient languages. They're in dead languages. 
It's in ancient Hebrew, not the Hebrew spoken today. It's in Aramaic. Nobody speaks it anymore. It's in Koine Greek. Nobody speaks it anymore. So that the only way to know what the Bible has to say is to ask somebody who knows these languages and he will tell you. So that when people say they read the Bible, what they mean is they read a translation of it. And it is in the translation that this first complaint shows up in the Quran of people who they had the truth in front of them, but they say something else. To give you one example, you have throughout the Old Testament many individuals and even objects which are called Messiah in the Hebrew. The word simply means something anointed. If you dip something in water, you pour water over it, you pour oil over it or something, you anoint it, you designate it for a purpose, you give it a name, or in the Greek the terminology is to christen. Even when a baby is traditionally given its name, they say it's christened, they put a little oil on its forehead and they give it its name. This is a very common piece of terminology. You find it all through the Bible, Messiah. But in any English translation of the Bible that you read, you'll only find the word here and there. You'll only find it in the places that seem to be pointing toward Jesus. You don't find it, for example, in the book of uh, Isaiah where it refers to a certain Persian named Cyrus as God's Messiah. No, they translate Messiah in these places. They say, anointed one. The idea being that if they simply wrote Messiah every time, people would get a different impression as to the importance of that word. But if you only use Messiah in places that point to Jesus, and you translate it in other places, you hide from people the fact that Messiah doesn't mean anything too very special. It simply means when you name something, you choose it. When God says, that's the one. And so Messiah takes on a magic kind of a meaning. It takes on a meaning where people seem to think, must mean maybe God. Yes, when you say Messiah, it means God. That's the psychology of it. And it works. Because the story is reported in the Bible how somebody asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? And he apparently said, yes. And the man said, oh, blasphemy. And he tore his garments. And people said, you see there? He claimed to be God. He said he was the Messiah. Well, think about it. If Messiah means God, then nobody can ever say it to a Jew. The Jews who are waiting for the Messiah... The day he really comes and he says, I'm the Messiah, they say, no, 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 we have to kill you. Because when you say Messiah, it means you're claiming to be God. We're waiting for the Messiah so we can kill him when he comes. Because he can't say he's the Messiah, I guess. That's the, the nonsense that it leads to. It's a, a very uh, twisted kind of interpretation. The reason the man would be upset if somebody claimed he was the Messiah, the reason he would say that's blasphemy, is because he'd say the man's lying. He said God picked him and I know God didn't. That's really the only thing he could have been thinking of. The word itself can't carry some meaning of divinity. But I'm digressing. This is the first complaint of the Quran. That people have something in front of them and something else is what they give out. Second point is somewhat similar to that. The Quran says they have passed over much that they have in front of them. Some things are right there and they don't mention them. They've missed them. Or maybe overlooked them. One group of these things is well known, it's cataloged. It's usually called the difficult sayings of Jesus. These are the sayings that don't fit in with Christian ideas. So we don't talk about them, or we put them in a box and say, these are the difficult sayings of Jesus. As to why they're difficult, we can get to later. But as an example of this kind of thing, there was a Jesuit priest by the name of uh, Xavier Leon Dufour who spent his academic career researching the few words of Jesus that are reported in the Bible, and there's not very many. He wanted to discover which of these words can we be absolutely sure Jesus really said, because somebody might have put other words in his mouth years after when they wrote this story. And what was his conclusion? Very logical. He said, well, at least we can be sure of these words, and he had a collection of words. He said, we can be sure he said these words which disagree with the church. His reasoning is very sound. He says, because we know the church didn't put them there. They say the opposite to what the church says, or they're against what the church says, so the church didn't put them there. They must be left from something he really said. And nobody ever was brave enough to try to change them. It makes a lot of sense. You have to wonder why Father Dufour didn't 
take a second look at that and think, well, then what am I doing in the church? If I can be sure that Jesus said this and it disagrees with the church, why am I still here? He apparently didn't follow through on that thought. And the third point is, as we have talked about so far, really, the Quran complains that people have attributed status to things that don't deserve the status. That this and this and this may come from God, but these things don't, and yet people put these along with the others to say, oh, this too, this comes from God. As, for example, to have the book of Jonah, which says it came from God, and to take another book, which doesn't say anything of the kind, and put it in here between the same covers. That's the other complaint in the Quran. There is a verse which is read from the Quran very often by missionary workers in order to try to fool Muslims on this and possibly they don't do it in um, dishonesty. Some of them do, I'm sure, but uh, others may simply have never noticed the point before. They read from the fifth surah in the 48th ayah, the verse which says that of the Quran that it is a book sent to confirm the truth of previous books. And so they say, you see there, it says in your book that my book is true. Well, what's interesting about that is they read half a sentence. They stop too soon. That isn't the whole verse. It's very much longer. It makes two more points. But the one that's relevant here is it continues on to say that the Quran is a book which confirms the truth which is in their books and it acts as, and the Arabic word in this place is Mohammed, it acts as quality control over what is in their books. In other words, it confirms that which is true in there and it acts as a measurement to say, ah, but not this or this or this. This can't be true. It acts as a measurement of the quality of those books. That's the second half of that thought which is not usually quoted. So by quoting half of it, sometimes they hope to fool the Muslims and say, look, your book says, read my book, it's true. It doesn't say that. Why does the Muslim quote the Bible? Actually, he quotes the Bible for the same reasons as apparently Jesus quoted from the Scriptures. You see, today, it happens in many churches, not all, that when the Bible is quoted, it's to prove a point. That is to say, this is true because it says here. That's an innovation in Christianity. That only dates back a few hundred years. You go back farther than that, and the Christian church used to debate many issues, but they didn't settle their debates by each team coming and saying, but look, it says in chapter this and verse that, this thing, and somebody else says, no, but it says in this place that. They never did that. They talked about it on... Uh, logical grounds and traditional grounds and so on, but they didn't do it by bringing text and saying, look, it says here and it says here. That's an innovation from the Middle Ages to quote proof texts. Because it was well understood that that was apparently never even Jesus' attitude toward the Scriptures. He didn't go around telling the Jews, look, if I want to prove something to you, all I have to do is quote from your Scriptures and it's proven because they're true. He didn't do that. In fact, a uh, I can almost guarantee the reaction to this question if you ask somebody who is uh, a dedicated sort of a Bible believer. And as I say, many Christians feel the same about the Bible as the Muslim, that it has some value, but it's not word perfect. But if you find the type of Christian who says, no, it's word perfect, if you ask him, why do you search the Scriptures, and the, the wording there is critical, ask him, why do you search the Scriptures? What do you hope to find there? Probably the light will go on. And it's, oh, yes, I know that verse. It's a verse which he will quote back to you that relates an occasion where Jesus said to some Jews, you search the scriptures because you think that in there is the key to eternal life. And they say, you see there? That's why we search the scriptures. Because Jesus said that in there is the key to eternal life. But listen carefully. Is that what he said? He said to the Jews, you read your scriptures because you think that in there is the key to eternal life. He didn't say, and you're right. He didn't endorse their opinion. He said, that's what you do. And the rest of his thought was to go on and say, but I'm telling you that if you knew what you were reading, you'd be listening to me because those things you're reading tell you about me. So his point was, whether what you have in your hands is true or false is beside the point right now. The point is, you think it's true, and in this place, and that place, and that place, it talks about me, so why aren't you listening to me? 
and that is the same as the Quran speaks of the books or the scriptures possessed by the Jews and the Christians it tells them if you have a doubt that this is a true prophet that is speaking of the prophet Muhammad it says if you have some doubt look in your book and you will see it tells you about him if you believe your book then you'll find in this place it says something about him so you should be listening to him See, the issue is not whether your book is true or false on this occasion. The issue is that these people think it's true, but they are refusing to read the indications that point them toward this man, the same as Jesus said. Our complaint, again, is not against the Bible. The Muslim is not against the Bible, unless you explain very carefully what you mean. He's against an attitude held about the Bible. He's against an attitude held by some people who have a book filled with many mistakes and contradictions but who claim, in spite of that, this came from God. The Muslim is upset at that attitude because that's an insult to the one they claim is the author of that book. Usually, this attitude is held as a, hey, just by a portion of Christianity. You have here the two kinds of Christians I'm talking about. The mainstream of Christianity, and these are usually denominations like Roman Catholic, uh, Anglican, um, Episcopalian, I guess, in the, the U.S., uh, some of the more established older denominations who understand that the Bible has a lot in it that came from God and some other things too, and the Muslim agrees. It is the so-called fundamentalist group who say, no, God gave us every word in here. All of this came from him. When you proceed to point out some of the mistakes in it, they modify their position so that they make an excuse for these mistakes. And the excuse is usually in this form. They will say, well, the Bible is correct or inerrant in the original manuscripts. See, what we have today are copies. In the original, there were no mistakes. In the copies we have today, there are mistakes. Well, that's interesting, but that doesn't leave you with anything, does it? If you say, we have a perfect book, we just don't have a perfect copy of it. Well, what it means is you have a perfect book someplace, but you can't see it. I mean, what good is it if you don't know what's in it? If I bring you a book with mistakes and I say, well, it used to be perfect. Well, then what good is it to you? You have based some kind of a belief on what used to exist, which in fact you've never seen. The copy that didn't have the mistakes in it. So there's no evidence you can bring forward for that. It's also inconsistent with uh, what the book itself says, at least in one understanding of the words. In the Bible book of Isaiah, it's in the 40th chapter, verse 8. In this book, God, uh, speaking through Isaiah supposedly, has said that the word of our Lord stands forever. That's all, no excuses. He doesn't say, the word of our Lord stands forever except for a few small mistakes. He doesn't qualify it. So if God says it, it doesn't get lost. It stands forever. So to say that, well, what God said, as some of it has been lost, is inconsistent with that claim. What's even worse is that it goes against what the Bible itself says if you claim every word in here came from God the book itself says that isn't true. You have, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 25, here's one place, one example, where the writer says, in effect, he says, what I'm about to tell you did not come from God. It's my opinion. He says, God has not given me a thing to tell you on this issue, so I will tell you what I think. So he specifically said, this here didn't come from God. So if you claim all of this came from God, you're going against what it says itself. As it happens now, in reality, and here I'm afraid we'll get into the most difficult material that uh, I'll try to deal with in these next few minutes. Uh, try hard to follow what I'm getting at, and that's the idea and the advantage of the videotape. So look at it again. What usually happens in the fundamentalist stream of Christianity, these are the people are you usually are in contact with the evangelical element who are trying to win over the poor pagan Muslims they usually forget this apology that they have made that is 
where they have said the Bible has no mistakes in the original, which we don't have today. They usually forget that and instead work very hard at trying to explain away every possible conflict. So that anything you bring them to say, look, this part here disagrees with that part, they'll find some way to explain that difficulty away. As it happens, these conflicts within the Bible are not cited by Muslims or uh, various enemies of Christianity, which the Muslim is not <laughs> in the first place. These conflicts were first discovered by sincere Christians who wanted to be sure of what they believed. Back to Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 again, that verse that I read where Paul says, All scripture is inspired of God and beneficial for teaching, for reproving, for setting things straight, as it is sometimes translated. Well, one large group in Christianity appreciates from that sentence the emphasis on the word profitable or helpful. They understand by that that Paul here is saying scripture is inspired by God and it's useful. It can do some good for you so that they measure inspiration. They say the more useful a verse is, the more inspired it is. Inspiration is a thing that comes in quantities. Say this verse is helpful, this one is more helpful, this one has more inspiration to it, or it's more inspiring. The other group, the fundamentalist group, does not consider inspiration as a thing you can measure, that you have more or less of it. They say it's a state of affairs. It's like pregnancy. You are or you aren't. And so they do not uh, stress the usefulness of a verse. They say, all of the Bible is inspired. God gave it. These are God's words. Not just the ones that seem to do a lot of good for us. God said this. This is God's word. It's inspired. What's interesting is that, just as a side point, they don't really stick to that either. Because it, usually if you ask a man, why do you believe that these words of God are inspired? He'll tell you, look how effective they are. They changed my life. Well, that's back to the other side's position. It's the non-fundamentalist who should be more likely to say that. To say, I believe these words are inspired because they had such an effect on me. Officially, the fundamentalist position is, no, no, you don't judge according to uh, effect as though we measured inspiration. The Bible is God's word. That's the way it is. As an example of the first state of affairs, we go back to Luther. And here's a man who decided which parts of the Bible are inspired by virtue of which parts gave God's message. But that means he had to decide what is God's message in the first place. So Luther decided that the sole content of Revelation, the only thing Revelation means, is man's justification in Christ. It doesn't really matter right now what he meant by that, but that's what he said, that's what all the Bible means, man's justification in Christ. Therefore, the thousands of verses that don't talk about that subject are irrelevant. So he has no opinion on them to say, well, since this doesn't say anything about man's justification in Christ, it's not really inspired scripture. I'll put it in the back of the book as an example. Or, or at least he would point out in his commentaries that this is not worth as much as this because this doesn't talk about the message. That was Luther's idea. Other people have other ideas. They say, no, the Bible means this. And the only parts of it that are inspired are the parts that tell about this. The other parts, since they don't tell about this, probably they're not inspired. God didn't put them there. In fact, that position takes this form then. People are saying, God intends to tell us this. He intends to tell us thus and so. And he repeats it here and here and here. So these are the places where the Bible is inspired. That's their attitude. Now this becomes a case of playing the odds. That is, people are trading on probabilities then because if you challenge somebody, say, how do you know this is what God means to tell us, that this is the sole message? They can't settle that by quoting the Bible. 
See, if you bring them a verse that says, but this verse doesn't, this verse seems to go against that thing you said, they'll simply tell you, well, that verse isn't inspired because it goes against what I said. You see? You can't settle it from the Bible. It becomes uh, a matter of probabilities to where, in fact, the mainstream of Christianity will by and large admit that. That over the centuries they've modified ideas about what the Bible means because they know you can't pin it down. It probably means this. But some other things come to their attention and over the years they may tend to regard maybe this is the message and that leaves aside some of the things they used to stress before. On the other hand, the fundamentalist does not stress or, or rate his texts according to whether they tell the story he likes or not. He claims that, at least. He says, I'm not free to say, this verse came from God because I like the sound of it, and this verse doesn't because I don't like the sound of it. He said, I'm not free to do that. All of these verses came from God. Now, whether he sticks by that or not is another story, but that's what his official position is. But now what happens is, in order to take the Bible as a whole as coming from God, not to just say these parts of it do, then you have to use interpretation to unite it. See, as an example, and it's very convenient to look up, in the two stories of the life of Jesus, one reported by Matthew and one reported by Luke, it's in chapter 4 of both books, we have the story of when the devil came to tempt Jesus. For the sake of argument, suppose it really happened. I'm not saying this is an authentic report of what happened. Just for the sake of the discussion. According to Matthew, the devil said to Jesus, as a challenge, he said, turn these stones into bread. And then he took him up to the top of a high building and said, throw yourself off and see if God sends an angel to catch you. And then he said, to Jesus, if you worship me, I will give you the kingdoms of the world. So three things the devil tried to tempt him with. He said, make the stones into bread. He said, throw yourself off the building. He said, worship me. In the fourth chapter of the book of Luke, we have the same story, but not in the same order. Now both men tell it like a chronological event. They say, then, after that, and then. But in Luke's account, he changes the order of the last two. Luke says, that the devil told him turn the bread, or turn the stones into bread. Uh, then he said, uh, worship me. Then he said, throw yourself off the building. Which way did it happen? One, two, three, or one, three, two? Now, one interpretation of this might be that you look at this and you see two different versions of the same event, and you could interpret that to mean, well, this book has mistakes in it. That's an interpretation. In fact, you might say, what does God mean to tell me in this place? Maybe he means to tell you, look out. This book has errors in it. It's a way of warning you. That's a possible interpretation. But instead, the type of Christian who will say, no, every word in the Bible is true, says, no, no, that's not what God meant. He meant something else here. He can't usually tell you what, but you know, he, he had some other reason for scrambling the order of events here. Well, It's funny that already people will change their standards because remember I mentioned there are about 70 Gospels known of. Only four are in the Bible. If you ask a person, what about, say, these 65 Gospels here? Why aren't they in the Bible? They'll tell you too many mistakes. They conflict with each other or they conflict with the ones we have. So they must be wrong. But when you come to four that are in the book and you say, but these conflict with each other. They say, no, no, that's different. God meant to tell us something here. So you can always find a way to excuse it for what he's got. But I suggest you could find just as many excuses to justify the others and maybe include gospel number five or six or seven at least. So the, uh, the unification of these things is done by interpretation. That is, on the one hand, they will exclude these because they are in disagreement. But on the other hand... They will allow these, even though they have disagreements, because they can find a way, and find an interpretation that will allow for it. Now, this is possibly the most tricky point, <laughs> the hardest to follow. If any of you study in physics, then the principle should be clear to you. 
as the uncertainty principle, which relates to a number of things that happen in physics. Uh, most uh, commonly cited as an example of the uncertainty principle is that there are some things that if you measure one very precisely, then you can't measure the other quantity very precisely. And if you measure this one more precisely than this one, you can't measure as precisely. Usually they cite uh, the momentum and position of a particle. They say if you know exactly where an item is, you can't be sure of how much momentum it has. If you can measure exactly the momentum, you can't be sure of exactly where it is. See, the precision here makes this fuzzy, or if you make this precise, this gets fuzzy. Well, that's what happens in this case of the inspiration of the Bible. And it works in this way. If we know what the Bible means, then we don't know how much of it came from God. On the other hand, if we believe that all of it came from God, that is, we measure, we say, this came from God, then we can't be sure what it means. You follow that? I'll explain why. But the point is, if you are sure of the meaning, you can't be sure how much of it is divinely inspired. If you're sure that this is the quantity that is divinely inspired, you can't be sure what it all means. Why? Well, in the first case, if you say the Bible means this, then you have a large collection of verses, chapters, that don't say anything about this meaning. And you have Luther's problem, who said, well, the, I know the Bible means this, so where it says this, it must be God's Word. But all these places that don't even talk about that subject, you don't know what to say about them. They don't mention this thing, this thing which gives the status of divine revelation to words so are they revealed or not can't be sure they don't touch on this subject which is the key to identifying revelation on the other hand if we say no all of this is inspired then we can't be sure what it means for this reason if you say all of this is inspired then I point to a place and say but this disagrees with this part What's the meaning of that? To me, it means human error. What's it mean to you? People have to come up with a meaning which enables them to hold it all together. They have to assign a meaning. They have to say, well, well, it could mean this. It could mean that. But they can't be sure. Because in order to be sure that this is the meaning of these conflicts, they'd have to be able to point to a verse somewhere in the Bible that tells you that's what this conflict means. A place where God says, by the way, in Matthew chapter 4, you'll find a disagreement with Luke chapter 4. What I meant to tell you was this in that place. You don't find that. See, if you did, there wouldn't be any of these conflicts. If people could always say, this seems to disagree with this, and somebody else would say, no, here's the verse that explains that. Can't be done. There is no Bible solution that is indicated to these conflicts in many cases. Now, there's a tight little circle that some people go in. You find it, for example, in the introduction to what is called the Living Bible, which is a paraphrase of the Bible. That is, it's not just a translation, but then the translation has the thoughts of the editor included on certain subjects, adding a lot of words and so on. That's what a paraphrase is, and it's admitted. It says on the cover, usually, this is a paraphrase, but in the introduction to the Living Bible, the authors or translators say that, of course, they recognize that if you are translating something but you're adding your own thoughts, this could be dangerous. They admit that. They say, but, they tell our readers, don't worry, because we have always been guided when we added our own thoughts by a strict evangelical position. They don't seem to realize they've gone in a circle. This school of thought called evangelism in Christianity came from these interpretations. That is, people said, we are evangelists because we believe that this means that, and this means this, and this means that. Then years later, they say, now we'll translate the Bible, and you can be sure of our meaning because we stick to evangelical means. Well, <laughs> evangelism grew from giving these meanings, and you come full circle. Now, as it happens, of course, sometimes people will try to tell you that, as I said, they forget their apology that any conflicts in the Bible just came from miscopying. 
they'll try to tell you any mistake you show, any conflict, this against that, we've got an answer for it. They'll often try to tell you that. And they have an answer for a lot of these things, and that's good research, fine. But they tend very often to believe that there is an answer for everything, even though they haven't answered everything, they've answered a lot of problems. And usually, in regard to the illustration I'm using here, this is how it goes. When you cite the conflict between Matthew and Luke on this temptation story, they'll tell you, well, you see, the key is here in the introduction to the account according to Luke. Luke said when he started to write that he was writing everything accurately. So you see, Matthew didn't write accurately. Luke did. The key is there. That if we have a doubt, if Matthew disagrees with Luke, then we should take Luke if we want to be accurate. Because Luke said, mine is accurate. So that is often the answer. In the same way, the Gospel according to Mark is corrected by Luke. In Mark chapter 6, verse 8, you have instructions on an occasion being delivered by Jesus. It's Mark 6 and 8. And Jesus is telling them what to take with them when they go. Mostly he tells them what not to take. He says, don't take this and don't take that and be sure you take this and so on. But in Mark 6 and 8, he says, take a staff with you. A stick. In Luke chapter 9, verse 3, same episode, Jesus says, don't take anything, don't take a stick in particular. He says, do not take a staff. I well, have two versions of the same story. Take a staff, don't take a staff. So again, I suppose a person might say, well, Luke is accurate. He's the one who said he's accurate, so he overrules Mark. Well, so far, you're sort of solving your problems. But now what do you do when you come to a place where Matthew and Mark disagree with each other and Luke doesn't say anything about it, which one of them is accurate? You have as an example Matthew chapter 27, verse 34, as compared to Mark chapter 15, verse 23. In the one place, it says they gave Jesus wine to drink and they put vinegar in it. In the other place, it says, no, they sweetened it. Well, which did they do? You look up the episode in Luke, no comment, doesn't say anything about the episode, so which one of these stories is true? We know that we can't trust Matthew or Mark to be accurate because Luke is accurate. But now these two have different versions and Luke doesn't straighten us out. So it, it doesn't work. Now I'm afraid very often it seems Muslims want to put the most emphasis on this kind of thing to say, ah, I have some verses I can really show somebody uh, the mistakes he has. Well, fine, but you have to be able to go somewhere after this. Be ready for what people tell you after this. Usually what they will stress, I can almost promise it will happen this way, is that after you've had quite a session like this to try to tell somebody, look, these things are in disagreement, this doesn't do the job, and so on, what do you say to that? Usually we fall back to another idea, which comes from Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. It's in this place, they will quote it to you, it's in this place where Paul says that it's the spirit that gives life, it's the letter that kills. And what they mean to tell you by that is to say, see what your problem is. You're trying to pin down the letter perfect Bible. And Paul said, if you do that, you see, you kill everything. It's the spirit of it that matters. That's the part that gives life. Never mind the fine details, it's the spirit why was it said and what does it sort of mean to tell us over and above all of these conflicts well really a person ought to, who brings that up as a counter argument to what you say ought to be fined for something I think that is so outrageous because that is your complaint against them it is they who said the Bible is letter perfect and when you try to show it isn't letter perfect, they say you shouldn't try to show it's letter perfect. You should just take the spirit of it. You see, that's, that's their problem, not your problem. It's they who have put themselves in this position. And again, I will stress, this is an element of Christianity. This is the kind you see on television Sunday mornings, usually. By and large, most Christian churches will tell you the same thing as the Muslim says. But there's a lot of value in here, and God meant to tell us a lot of things, but certainly he didn't mean to say this, and this can't be from him. And since this is a mistake, that isn't God's word, and so on. Most churches feel that way. 
So the one who says he's the fundamentalist who says, no, no, history shows that the true Christian has always regarded every word in here as being from God. That's not true. He's never read history if he says that. You can go right back as far as you want in the history of the Christian church, you'll find people within the church who disagreed with that. 17 centuries ago, who said, no, 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 it's the message that matters, it's not the precision of the details, these were men, sometimes they made mistakes. These are just history. It's the same as the Muslim would say about the narrations of the prophet, hadith. They say, valuable, yes, but if you start to insist every word is true, you may get in trouble. Because that's, it's not the Quran. The Quran comes to you as a revelation, hadith, these are what men say. That's why we spend so much effort in trying to establish the truth of something. To say, it came from this man, and this man reported, and we check these things out. But they don't have the same status. What does history show? Well, this too shows the difficulty that somebody's in. If he tries to tell you, history shows that true Christians have always regarded this as divine... Well, what's he holding in his hand when he tells you that? The Bible, which is what? History. And contains what? Mistakes. So, in effect, he's undone himself. He said, history tells us this. Uh, Mind you, this history, in fact, the one that's connected with my whole argument, has some mistakes in it. So, I'm not suggesting that's the Muslim position to say you can't trust history. I'm saying he should keep that in mind if he's putting too much emphasis on tradition, and yet the very sources of that tradition contain mistakes within it. So it is that we come back to another understanding of things. You see, as I mentioned this verse, Isaiah 40 and 8, where they say the word of our God stands forever. Well, it's true that some will give that a different meaning. They'll say, Well, that doesn't mean the words that are in the Bible, the exact words, will stand forever. It means the message will not be changed, won't get lost. What God meant to say won't get lost in the shuffle. That, too, is a possible meaning. And it's a good idea for people who will separate words from message. And if somebody will do that, they'll tell you it's the message, not the precise words, that matter. Remember he said that the next time he tells you that the Bible contains the Injil. Because what he's trying to tell you is the words of the Injil are in here. You're trying to tell him, no, no, maybe the message, but not the words. In fact, you have an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about in Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew chapter 6 is the so-called Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. Christians recite it, but in these two places where It's given by Jesus to say, pray this way, and he gives this prayer. There's two different versions of the prayer. They're very similar, but with a different wording. And as it happens, Christians choose one over the other. So, it's obvious when you look at this, well, Jesus' exact words are not reported then, are they? Because we have two versions of the same thing. So it must be his message, uh, not the actual words that matter. Now, it's important to remember that, or somebody will concede that point, that, okay, it's the message, not the words. Because what often happens is, at least in the fundamentalist camp, if you ask a man place where he said, okay, it's not the exact words, it's the message, that he has eliminated this basis of belief. That may be one of many reasons he has to believe, but he has eliminated that one, which is often used by people, people who write volumes on the perfection of the Bible. There's one called... uh, Theomatics, uh, which uh, is supposed to be showing you the numerical miracles of the Bible. One man named Ivan Pannon wrote 43,000 pages by hand about the numerical miracles in the Bible. It's another subject, of course, but what's funny about that is they're telling you this is a miracle of arithmetic, this book. And yet if you point out to them that Matthew says that uh, uh, 3 times 14 is 41, I'll tell you a small mistake. Uh, it's, it's, it's 42 <laughs> um, among others I mean, if you cite Ezra chapter 7 versus Nehemiah chapter 9 where it gives you conflicting statistics it's a small matter you cite from the books of Samuel and Chronicles that it tells you about 40,000 horsemen here and 4,000 here that tell you a small mistake somebody lost a zero uh, and so on it's beside the point that the Hebrews didn't have a zero at the time they had to spell the words out but um, 
in any case, he has eliminated one type of foundation of belief if he's moved over to saying it's the message, not the words. So it is, again, as I say, Injil is at best a message that is found in the Bible, not the actual words. In other words, what they should be saying to you, or at least claiming to you more accurately, would be to say, we have the Bible, what we have is some information about the Injil. They shouldn't be saying, we have the Injil. Arabic translations of the Bible usually do that. They'll say, we have the Injil. They label four Injil. Angel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if it's the message that matters, let's move on to another kind of a subject, which I see we're going to have to continue. Uh, never going to get through the rest of this material this morning, but we have plans for later on. I also want to stress it is not the Muslim's job to reinterpret the Bible. There's a lot of misunderstanding about that, I'm sure. If a, uh, you have in the newspaper here a series of articles that I had written some two or three years ago. The point of all that is not to go to the Christian and say, look, your book says this, you're wrong. The real meaning is this. That's not our job. Not telling him, you misunderstand your book. What it means is this. Our intention is to show, and this is the fourth important point I want to make, our intention is to show that what they are using as a foundation is an interpretation. You see, interpretation is not a foundation for something. If you have some evidence that you gather and you say, this evidence proves such and such, well, you're wrong if there is some other meaning that could be given to that same evidence. You see, as long as your evidence has more than one meaning, then you still haven't really proved your case. You may have given some good indications for it, but as long as somebody can say, no, that doesn't necessarily mean this, could mean that. As people may say that uh, the earth is flat because of the appearance of the horizon on the ocean. It's a nice straight line. The earth is flat. Well, maybe. But in fact, if the earth was round and big enough around, that line would still look like it looks. So you haven't proved it's flat yet. So you just have compatible evidence. As a matter of fact, if the earth was flat, it wouldn't look like that. But <laughs> that's a... a the kind of thing I'm trying to illustrate is that as long as you're just interpreting something, giving it a meaning, you haven't proven it yet, if somebody can give it another meaning. We just mean to point out that when people say this verse and that verse and this verse mean this, if you can say, but you know it could mean something else, could mean this and this and this, that doesn't mean you're insisting on your meaning, you're saying it could mean this, you're showing there are other possibilities, so you have no right to insist that yours is the only possibility. That's really the debate. Quran talks about how people got into this kind of thing. It tells about half the story of religion in the third surah, in the sixth ayah, when it tells us that the verses in the Quran come in two kinds, the muhkamat and the mutashabihat. Muhkamat means those that are locked in place. There's no possibility that you could read them and give them more than one meaning. First ayah of that surah says, Allah, la ilaha illahu. Allah, there is no God but He. Now, how could a group of people sit around and discuss that and say, well, what do you think? That could mean this. Somebody said, no, I disagree. Maybe it means this. You can't have two meanings. It's locked in place. And some other verses are mutashabihat, which means if you tear them loose from the page, you take them over here, you can give them two or three meanings. Give them many meanings. If you take them loose from the foundation of the book, which is the Muhkamat, take them out of context, you can make them say all kinds of things. There's a man wrote a little booklet proving to Muslims that Jesus is God because of what the Quran says about him. And what he does is he quotes a handful of verses which he rips loose from the page and gives to you. This ayah warns you that if you're always paying attention to those things that are ambiguous and you forget about the ones that are locked in place, you go astray. And the reason that the Quran is like that is because there's not a defect in the book. It's because it's a book that talks about itself. The Quran talks about the Quran, which means that each piece can't stand all by itself. Otherwise, you have 6,100 pieces. You don't have a book. Some pieces have to talk about other pieces. So some verses sit on other verses. But this is what people do if they tell you these are the clear sayings of Jesus and these are the difficult sayings of Jesus. They trade the labels. 
and tell you, this clearly says Jesus is God. If you bring them a verse which denies that, they tell you it's difficult. Put it aside. If you change the labels around, you solve the problems. See, as an example, if Jesus, it's reported, he said, uh, God knows things that I don't know. They tell you that's difficult. Say, how can God say that? God knows things I don't know. Say, well, that's difficult. But in this place, he says he's God because look, he said here that whoever honors me honors God. Well, he must mean he's God. Well, maybe could have meant something else. The Quran says that who uh, obeys Muhammad obeys Allah, not because of the same individual, but because Allah says obey this man. Now, by way of suggesting before getting into some of these details, if you are going to discuss this kind of thing, that is, what did Jesus have to say, who is he, and so on, you have to agree ahead of time, how are you going to recognize truth when you find it? I remember uh, in a session that I had one time where I began by stressing this very thing when it was my turn to speak in a sort of a dialogue or debate, I said, if we came here tonight to discuss chemistry and physics, and we had different opinions, probably we could settle them. We make some calculations, and we see who's wrong, who's right. We could do the same here if we agreed, what are the rules? So I suggested two rules. In particular, the one I said was, two exactly opposite things can't both be true. The other man's turn came to speak. He said, I like your rules, especially the second one. Two exactly opposite things can't both be true. But a few minutes later, when somebody asked him, who was Jesus? What was he? Was he mortal or immortal? These are exactly opposite. Mortal and immortal. That's mortal and not mortal. Which was he? Well, he shuffled around. He didn't have much to say for a minute. And so I asked him again. I said, the man is asking you, was he mortal or immortal? Well, he finally has to get Well, he's both. So he didn't want to play by the rules anymore. Now, that's not by way of ridicule. He simply didn't realize where he was going when he agreed to the rules. But we have to start by saying, how do we know truth when we find it? Can we do it by uh, sticking to a logical discussion? Or is there some other standard? And what some people will tell you is, there's other ways. Until you trust your feelings. The Quran warns against that. It reminds you that if you use this faculty of your feelings to judge truth, you're in danger. It is your feelings which used to make you afraid of the dark when you were a child. It is your feelings which can make, for example, a grown man run from a little spider. He knows it can't hurt him, but he can't help how he feels. He may just have a peculiarity about spiders and he runs away. If you trust that same faculty to say, my feelings will tell me when something's true, you're asking for trouble. But that's a thing that's insisted on by many. A great deal of it goes back to a man, and few people remember his name, but he lived about 150 years ago, named Schleiermacher. And the scientific community at that time were challenging the religious community very often and embarrassing them. And so Schleiermacher made the suggestion to the religious community, saying, next time the scientist wants to argue with him, you tell him you haven't got anything to argue about. His truth is objective and yours is subjective. In other words, he's saying his truth is the thing he arrives at by his intellect. Yours, you arrive at by your heart. And really the difference between objectivity and subjectivity means in objectivity, you choose the rules and you stick by them. Subjectivity means you change the rules according to the subject. You say that this will establish true and false under these circumstances, but it won't work here where I have to use something else. What do their own books say about that? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 question in this place is that God is asking man, you want your sins forgiven? What shall you do? What, what, what piece of advice is it? One piece of advice. Speaking through Isaiah. It's reported here. God says, come let us reason together. No qualification, no excuses. He doesn't say, let's reason together except be careful. Some things don't make any sense. But you have to believe those too. He says, let us reason together. Now of course, people can reason incorrectly. People have a valid point if they tell you, you know, uh, you can make mistakes when you're reasoning. That's true. But unfortunately, what people tend to do is they use that as justification for throwing out reasoning. 
So when you reason, you can make mistakes, so you shouldn't reason. But how do you know when you make a mistake when you're reasoning? Because some reasonable man comes along and points out to you where you made a mistake. You correct reasoning by reasoning. As you're smoothing over the mistakes or patching them up and so on by being reasonable. In reasoning, we want to look out for a number of things, and I can't really give a course on reasoning at this point, but I'll try to break it down into certain uh, ideas that may be useful as a guideline for you. Three things might be worth keeping in mind, and more of it is written up in a little booklet that I have left for you here. If anybody's looking for that booklet, <laughs> uh, if you're watching a videotape, it's sometimes called Missionary Christianity and ask around. I hope you can find a copy. People trade in false reasoning or in discussions very often on three kinds of things that we should watch out for. Vague statements, suppressed information, and incomplete thoughts. I can give examples of a number of these things. That is, sometimes people make a statement and you want to ask them exactly what do you mean. And if they try to make it exact, you have finished your discussion because it only works as long as it's fuzzy. Sometimes people make statements which are true, but they haven't told you all the truth. And if you can bring out some of the information that he has overlooked, you have finished your discussion. Sometimes people offer as arguments some thoughts that they are putting in front of you, but they haven't finished the thought. Somebody had suggested, I'm not going along with this idea, but I'm just saying it. somebody has suggested, in fact it's been suggested many times, that um, Muslims should realize that in the story of Ibrahim, Abraham, as he went to sacrifice his son, this is just like when God sacrificed his son. Well, finish the thought that you start. Keep going. What happened? Ibrahim went to sacrifice his son. Eh, his son wasn't killed. Somebody was put in his place. I mean, you may as well finish what you start. I'm not saying that's what the Quran has to say about crucifixion, but that's an example of the kind of thing. If somebody starts something rolling, make it roll all the way to the end. More precisely to some examples that you have within the Bible, you have in John chapter 6, a place where Jesus is reported to have compared himself to the manna, the bread that came to the uh, Israelites in the desert. And people sometimes read this and they say, well look here, Jesus said that he was like the manna which came out of heaven. That means Jesus came from heaven. Well, what they've left kind of vague and unfinished in all of this is, do they literally mean both statements? See, where did the manna come from? Was it cooked in an oven in heaven and then sent to earth? If you read about it in the Bible, Numbers chapter 11, verse 9, it says it formed on the ground. You point that out to someone, they say, yes, well, when it says the manna came out of heaven, it means that God in heaven said, be, and there was the manna. It formed on the ground. It came out of heaven in that sense. It didn't physically come out of heaven. But when Jesus said he was like the manna who came out of heaven, that meant Jesus came from heaven, literally. Yes, he was up there and he came down here. You see what I mean? You've traded two kinds of meanings. You take a figurative meaning in the first case and a literal meaning in the second case. So that you say, here where Jesus said, he's like the man that came out of heaven, it means he came from heaven, literally. Maybe, but it's not likely in view of the, the total information as you look into it. John chapter 3, verse 16. The most translated sentence on earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, etc., the key word here is only begotten because I don't have time to go into it now I'd stress to you that anywhere that the Bible says that Jesus is a son of God you will find another place where it tells about somebody else who is a son of God in exactly the same way whether you say Jesus was the son by some physical, spiritual, adopted or whatever sense any place you point to say this tells about the sonship of Jesus. You can find another place which tells about a man who is a son in the same way, who is adopted or in some physical way or spiritual way or whatever, a son of God too. So that people point to this verse and say, ah, but this is the verse which says he's a son of God in a way that's different than anybody else is. 
it says he's the only begotten Son of God. Well, does it? Catholics don't translate it that way in their Bible because they appreciate the difficulties it leads into. That the Greek word in this place does not really mean only begotten. It could, but it's, uh, it's not technically the precise word the Greek would have been likely to use, but that's beside the point. The same word is found in another place, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, and here it says that Isaac was the only begotten son of Abraham. Same word in the original text. One applies to Jesus, one applies to Isaac. But when you point out to them that Isaac's older brother outlived his father, so at no time was Isaac literally the only begotten son of Abraham, they'll tell you, well, only begotten doesn't always mean only begotten. It can mean only begotten in a certain sense. So to modify the meaning a little bit. But if you can modify it in this place, why can't you modify it in that place where it says it of Jesus? Another example is, you see, there are scholarly people who are well aware of what the Bible has to say, and a lot of people are aware of explanations of Scripture, but they use one explanation on one occasion and another, another time. As an example, John chapter 14, verse 9, uh, it's reported Jesus said to a certain Philip, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And some people will tell you, See there, Jesus said he was God. He said, Philip, your eyeballs look at me, your eyeballs see God. I am God. Because they, they fill in the rest of what he meant to say. What he said was, If you see me, you see the Father. Now, if they mean literally, Philip is looking at God, then they mean or looking at the Father, then they mean Jesus is the Father. But he's supposed to be the Son, not the Father. In this place he says, if you see me, you see, you've seen the Father. And so when you point that out to somebody, say, yeah, but he said Father here, isn't he supposed to be the Son? I said, well, he said Father, he meant God. Okay, what if he did? <laughs> did he mean to tell Philip that when your eyes look at me, they look at God because I am God? Well, in John chapter 5, verse 37... Here's the same circumstances. Jesus is talking to a group of people who are standing there looking at him and hearing him. And he says to them, You people have never seen the Father nor heard his voice. Well, if he is God, how can he tell people who are looking at him and listening to him, You people, you've never seen God. You've never even heard him speak. They're listening to him. People will tell you, Oh, yes, but you see, what he meant here was, and they'll give you an explanation. But the point is, their explanation is used on this occasion to explain chapter 5, but they should realize that doesn't allow for the meaning in the other place. That is, if Jesus meant to say something symbolic here, then he couldn't have meant anything literal here. If he really meant to tell Philip, when you see me, you see God, because I'm God, then he, it's inconsistent with his statement of people who are literally looking at him, saying, you haven't seen God. We can go round and round with a great many passages of Scripture like this, but let me conclude this portion and try to finish up with uh, later on this afternoon with a, kind of a collection of valuable thoughts, I think, that you can take to people. Let me conclude by just mentioning that as often as you try to mention this sort of thing to people, as often as you may discuss Scriptures and so on, remember your point is not to reinterpret it, but to tell somebody, look, maybe it means what you say it means, but it could mean this also, because of these things. Their response to that, sooner or later, is to say, it doesn't matter. I can be sure of what he meant to say, because look here. And he reads you the stories of how, when Jesus said a certain thing, the Jews got angry with him. As an example, John chapter 10, verse 30, it's reported Jesus said, The Father and I are one. And they say, And look, what did the Jews do when they heard him say that? Never mind what excuses you make that he could have meant this or that or the other thing. He meant he was God because that's what the Jews thought he meant. They picked up stones to throw at him. He asked them, Why do you want to stone me? They said, You just claim to be equal to God. And he started, I want to stone him. And there they finish, verse 32. There's nine more verses in that chapter that people don't read. What did Jesus then say? Did he tell them, 
uh, I mean, to reconstruct the story. He said a word, and the Jews said, you just claim to be equal to God. What did he do say? Well, you're right, I'm afraid. I have no choice. So you see, I am God. He didn't do that. He corrected them to say, but you misunderstood me. That's the point of the next nine verses. He said, no, what I said to you is this, this, this. Doesn't your scripture say that and that and that? Therefore, how can you say that I have blasphemed? I've done a thing that you should stone me for. Read it for yourself. But you see, that's the whole context of that. He's, the Jews have misunderstood him. In other words, there were two opinions about Jesus, at least. Some people said that he's less than God, and some people may have said he's claiming to be God. Which opinion did he endorse? Both opinions were wrong, but the only records you'll ever find on the subject are where somebody said something about him that lifted him too high, he corrected him. Well, and that's not so, because other opinions went by. But that, of course, that's a big subject. But basically, I hope you see what I'm getting at, is that people have done a curious thing when they have built a religion around the idea that, well, Jesus said a lot of things that his disciples did not immediately understand. They had to gain the understanding by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It came to them later and it inspired them and it told them, what did Jesus mean when he said this and that and so on? In fact, he was God. It, it revealed that to them later on. I tell you that on the one hand, that his disciples didn't understand him until they had help from God. But on the other side, when you say, how do you know what he meant to say? They'll say, the Jews understood him. They didn't need any help from God. The Jews knew what he meant to say. When he made this claim or that claim, they knew he was talking about being God. In other words, they're saying his friends didn't understand him, his enemies did. Does that make much sense? His complaint is reported in Mark chapter 4, that the Jews don't understand me for a start but more on uh, this kind of thing uh, later on inshallah thank you for your time and attention for now